father at the crucifixion. Could you speak to that for just a second? Second Corinthians 5, that's a beautiful, verse 14 and following is a beautiful passage. Um, Paul, that's where Paul says that um, I determined no one, uh, uh, no one according to the flesh. He says, I recognize that one died for all, therefore all die. Because the one that died is not just a person, it's the one in whom all things are held together were created. When he died, we died. And then he keeps working it down. And the verse you're talking about is, is that we've been reconciled in Christ, and therefore I beseech you, is that the verse? Or God was in Christ. Yeah, he says that God was in Christ reconciling the cosmos of the world to himself. So not only is Jesus, not only are we included in Jesus, but also he's saying God was in Christ, that we're all in Christ. This is the foundation of what Paul Young is saying in his book on the shack where he said that oh, we were there, we were there together. Where was God? And when Jesus was dying, he was in Christ. That's why Papa has nail scars. How could Jesus suffer and his father not feel his pain? And how could the Holy Spirit, now the Holy Spirit would have manifested physically in the shack, she would have had nail scars too. Because this circle is the circle of sharing and mutual interpenetration. That's what the word perichoresis means. It means to make room for a mutual interpenetration without losing yourself. And the word perichoresis is about is everything we've been talking about today rolled into one word. Sort of like Emmanuel. Explain it. So the, the God was in Christ. We were in Christ. He was bringing this thing together. Just like I said earlier, he's, he's created. He sustains all things. Now he's going to take that relationship with us and he's going to establish that in the depth of our treachery and darkness. And he's bringing his Father and the Holy Spirit with him. So when you really look at it, who is in Christ? All creation, the Father, the Holy Spirit, all humanity right there. In Second Corinthians, beautiful passage. There's another passage that's often overlooked. It's First Corinthians chapter eight. I'll look, read that um, in the light of our discussion today. Um, First Corinthians eight. Um, he's talking about sacrificing things to idols and all that. And Paul's saying, and then he says, uh, verse five. 1 Corinthians 8, 5 says, For even if there are so-called gods in heaven and on earth, or whatever he's talking about, the way people think, and there are many gods and many lords according to whatever, he says, Yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and we exist for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and we exist through him. Then look at verse 7. However, not all men have this knowledge. <laughs> Not everybody knows this, <laughs> but this is the way it is. You see it? All right, other comments or questions? In the very back. We don't, he didn't give up on the Father, and the Father didn't give up on him. And, and, he, and this is really important from a, a personal vantage point, certainly from a counseling and a pastoral or, uh, vantage point, is that when you're with someone who's in real despair, that Jesus knows how to minister his Father's love to them in that despair because he's been there and done that and got the T-shirt. Okay? He is our high priest, not by command, but by experience. And there's some wounds that require pierced hands to touch. That's why when we're praying with people, we're not trying to get them to do something from outside. We can actually say, close your eyes and look for light. And that light's not some ubiquitous thing out there. Flow. That would be Jesus meeting us. And he's learned how to meet. He's turned over every leaf in our despair. 
Not a single leaf is left unturned so that he's able to minister his Father and the Holy Spirit's anointing to us by experience right where we are. That's the hope that we have. Without that, then we've got to figure out how we can get them to agree to this to get that into their souls. Whereas we want them to discover it. That's why, that's why it's, it's okay for us to face the things that we're most afraid of. Like, like um, you know, sometimes you see behind uh, lecterns or whatever, there are curtains, and those curtains have folds in there. You know, I think what we're, <laughs> we're afraid of what's behind the folds of the curtains. And what we find is that's where Jesus is. And he brought his Father and the Holy Spirit. Well, we can spend our whole lives trying to hide from the folds. I've got a cartoon that I want somebody to draw where you've got this sort of dark area and it's the soul and there's an obvious door there and, and the evil one is opening the door and it's got enough of a crack so there's a little light coming out and he's, and he's looking back like I'm sneaking in and nobody knows it and he's looking this way but the crack is open and you can see through the crack and sitting inside is the Father, Son, and Spirit. <laughs> but we're not going to learn that. We're not going to learn that unless we're willing to, to open that door and look in the, and go behind the folds. That's hard. Irenaeus, the growing of the early church father, says that the Holy Spirit composed himself to dwell with us in Jesus. And at some point, someone talked about the Holy Spirit learning how to dwell with us. And so what you actually have in Jesus and through what we were doing to Jesus, I think, and who can know? I mean, you can't talk about God learning, although creation is new to God. Creation is not eternal. The incarnation was new to God. Certainly the crucifixion was new to God. And so there's newness that's going on. And and I I think in one way we could say the Holy Spirit is learning how to meet us in our darkness and pain by ministering to Jesus as he suffers from it. I mean, she she or he's not standing beside Jesus with a box of Kleenex thinking, sorry, you know, sorry. This This is empathy. This is mutual indwelling. And there's that sense in which God is coming to dwell by experience. Not just by theory, but by experiencing Jesus with us. And the way that happens is by experiencing what we're doing to Jesus. And the Father, Son, and Spirit suffer that together. And that's why we know they can meet us in anything. In any form of darkness. In any evil. Any evil. You, can, you can pray, no, and okay, watch the Father, Son, and Spirit pull the rabbit out of this hat. You know? There's a book called Genius, Grief, Grief and Grace. I, did, I never can remember the man's name that wrote it. But he's a psychiatrist and he takes figures from history, Christian history, like Martin Luther and, and I think Martin Lloyd Jones and maybe William Cooper and um, I'm not sure, I can't remember who else. But one of the figures is J.B. Phillips, the man that wrote you know, that great New Testament translation. And I love the story because J.B. Phillips was obsessive and compulsive. So, so what did he do? He did an exhaustive word study on every Greek word in the New Testament. And the Father said, see, what we think when we're trapped in this darkness, we think, okay, if I can just get good enough, then I could be of service. And the Father, Son, and Spirit are saying, oh, we got an obsessive, compulsive Greek scholar. Hmm, watch what we do with this. We can take that. And so it's not using us in spite of ourselves. It's, I like this. I, I got this. So I'm reading along these stories, and I'm thinking, hmm. Let's take a country boy from Mississippi <laughs> who's obsessive compulsive, who's a middle son, who grows up in a family that's super, 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 super high overachieving. Hmm. He tends to be creative, a little bit poetic. Hmm. Let's let him obsess on the Trinity for 25 years with the Torrance brothers and see what happens. <laughs> so <laughs> it's like you begin to see how the Lord is using you, not in spite of you and in spite of your brokenness, but, but you. All of you. And, when, and, and as that happens, you begin to have more confidence to speak to people about their fragments and their brokenness and see that Jesus is already in that, in those parts. And he refuses to let them go. It's just beautiful. It's just beautiful. This is why we, as a Christian community, have the most powerful word to say in counseling. 
Counselors are really good about helping you see what's wrong, and they want you to believe in yourself. But if you're really alert, you're going to say, well, that's the whole problem is I don't believe in myself, and there are real reasons for this. You know, and what we just can't let these things go. But you can believe in yourself if you know who's in you. If you know who's at the bottom, you can look at that, and it becomes something that needs to be removed rather than be, to be avoided. Of course you can believe in yourself if the Father, Son, and Spirit have taken up residence within you, and they have, and will never leave. That's not power of positive thinking. That's Christian gospel. All right, any other comments? We're nearing the time. Come on, I know better than this. John. Let me get let me get the uh, microphone to you before you talk to because people don't. Thank, thank you there. for your your question and your comments. By the way, it's... Um, I, I I wrestle with these things in the context of parenting. I've got a ten year old, an eight year old, and a one year old, and I don't feel like I have many good examples that I want to follow. I know a lot about what I don't want to do in my parenting and in my spiritual upbringing. And I, I find myself trying to get my kids to see Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in their own lives. I tell them stories about Father, Son, and Spirit, and those and my sons, they go on adventures together. Um, I, I, I want them to learn to see God happening in the world around them and in all the people that they know. But I find myself being really reticent to, I don't know, over-instruct them. Good. I, okay, that's a good thing. Um, yeah, I, I, I wrestle with knowing what to do with that. I, I feel like I'm doing the right thing, but I really don't know. That's difficult in the, in the Western Christian tradition because we're supposed to all be perfect. And that means our children are extensions of our image. And if they're not perfect, then everybody knows we're not perfect. That's part of the reason why there's so much craziness on the soccer field is that we're asking our children to justify our existence by the good works on the soccer field. They proved that our our gene pool is superior. We're not allowing them to play. They got to win, and they got to be on top because that's about me, not about them. And, and so I don't want to over instruct my kids <laughs> until I got some of that stuff kind of worked out. You know, I um I think it's beautiful to know that that I have I had this friend uh, we were talking and he was very concerned because his um, son-in-law uh, was depressed and was talking about getting a divorce from his daughter. And he was, my friend was very concerned about it. He wanted us to pray. We were having a meeting. He said, we need to pray. We need to pray. We need to pray. We need to pray. And I said, well, we are going to pray. And we did. But I said, but first, it seems to me that very often what we do in our prayers is we approach God as if we believe he's not interested in what we want. And what I told my friend that night, and I think this is important in what you're asking, and, I mean, and who knows? I mean, I, my son's 25, and I can tell you, I'm, 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 I'm getting a clue, I guess, but I'm, it's taken me a while to figure out how to be a good dad. But this, my friend, I said, listen, why don't we reverse this? Why don't we assume that this enormous burden that you feel for your son-in-law is actually the Father, Son, and Spirit letting you know they got it? This is their way of communicating with you that we are on top of this. We got this. You can you can relax now. And then once you relax, you can ask us what you want to do, how we, you know, participate. But very often, and this is interesting to me because in the Calvinist tradition that I grew up in, where we believe that we believed, I was taught that God ordains whatsoever things come to pass, yet we're control freaks. And, and like in the charismatic tradition where you're supposed to be following the Holy Spirit, they're control freaks. They're orchestrating the entire worship service. And it's like, well, there's no freedom to, for the Holy Spirit to do this or that. You've got to do it this way, this way. And it's like, wait a minute. So we can presume as parents that the Father, Son, and Spirit love our children and are for them or determined more than we ever dreamed for them to come to know the truth. And we can look for evidence of that in their lives and kind of encourage that. You know, we, can, we don't have to force them to be a certain way. We can let them be. And then we can see into their souls as to what they're gifted at and, and, and nurture that and then, and then encourage. But to me, I think that our children learn from the word that proceeds forth out of our being. So if they see freedom in dad, 
then that's beautiful. And they want to be a part of the conversation. If they feel dad or mom is trying to make them a certain way and look a certain way, that's going to create some difficulties. Uh, probably end up in a rupture in a relationship. And you either go rebellion or religion when you got that kind of pressure on you. So when you said didn't own, own over instruct, I think that's, that's good. You can assume that the Holy Spirit is working the room of the cosmos for the blessing of your children. You can assume that and you can look for it. That's a little bit different perspective, I think. It helps me know that whatever it is my children are getting into or where they're going, there's three persons in this cosmos that are so much more for them than I ever dared to dream, and they're pulling this together. And we can certainly warn them, but they will probably listen about like you and I listened. I'm just saying. I mean, I, you know, at 53, I don't, I can pretty much tell you what most 20-year-old guys are thinking and doing right now, and I've only been here 53 years, so can you imagine if you've been around for two millennia? And then you think, the Father, Son, and the Spirit, I think they understand how this works and where we are. So we can take some of that control back and say, and let it go, and say, okay, I want really for them what you want. I don't want to hinder, I want to help. Give me some light on this. And, and usually uh, your wife has a lot of light on that. Um, if you listen, which I'm finally learning to do after 30 years, a little bit. Any other? Any other? You want to? You want to respond back to that, John? I mean, that was a lot. Yeah, that's good. And and I I see the cool things God does with my kids. I, I learn about God from them, um, especially the ways that they're different from me. And really, especially the way that they're like me and the ways that I hate myself. Yeah, you can you can guarantee that your the parts of you um, that you don't like will be written large before your face in your children. <laughs> and you can you can blame them and try to, but you need to face the fact that that would be you. Um, and I'm not picking on you. I'm saying that's that's the way it is. If you want to see it, it's right there. You don't have to look far. <laughs> um, and also the strengths and weaknesses and the goodness. I never, I never made my children memorize scripture. I never made them go to church. Uh, they were a part of the conversation. If they wanted to be part of the conversation. And, and my children probably don't know the scriptures like I was taught them in terms of you memorized all these verses. But do they know the conversation? Do they have insight? There's a lot going on there that they know in their 20s that I didn't even begin to see until my late 40s. So my, my, my education of them just doesn't look very religious. That's good. Uh, 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 yeah, I get it. Well, I can tell you Jesus is not very religious. No. <laughs> and neither is Father and the Holy Spirit. So did somebody else have, do you have a comment? I did. You've been having fun today, hadn't you? Enjoyed it very much. I wanted to ask. Just, uh, I think you mentioned this in the earlier session about the Holy Spirit has a feminine side. What do you think about that? You mentioned that, and I, I must admit, I like it. <laughs> well, I, yeah, but I, I mean, I, I know that, but I mean, tell me about the Holy Spirit when you said that. Well, you, I was. She's asking about the feminine side of the Holy Spirit, if you want to say side. Uh, well, but in the Old Testament, ruach which is the Old Testament Hebrew word for spirit, sometimes translated wind. It's uh, 89 times in the Old Testament. Of the, there are places where everybody kind of agrees it's translated. Uh, that's the spirit it's referring to. Uh-huh. Of the 89, there's only nine times when it's masculine. The other 81 are all feminine. In the nine times where it is masculine, it comes within a like a paragraph where the main subject is Yahweh, which is masculine. So it gets kind of difficult uh, in terms of the grammar. Uh-huh. So, But even if there were nine instances of it being masculine in the Old Testament, there are 81 feminine. And of those 81 uses in the Old Testament, including Genesis 1-1 and all through Judges, is there 44 times it's a, it's a, uh, the feminine ruach is connected with a feminine verb. So in uh, when it says the Spirit of God hovered over the abyss in Genesis 1-2, uh-huh. A fair and good translation would be the Spirit of God, comma, she hovered. 
Now, why we don't know that, I think you can chalk that up to a lot of uh, male prejudice and power plays and things like that, because this should be part of the conversation, which then raises another question. Okay, well, well, if that was the case, why doesn't the New Testament reflect that? Mm-hmm. So why doesn't the New Testament refer to the spirit in feminine terms? I'm thinking, well, I don't know, but the New Testament, there is no neuter in Hebrew. Right. It's only male or female. There's neuter in Greek. So holy pneuma is neuter. And in some places, Jesus refers to the Holy Spirit as he. Um, as far as I know, in the New Testament, in the text that we've received, there is no reference to the Holy Spirit as she, although there's all these things like new birth and conception and stuff like that that are clearly more on, in the feminine world. And some of the ancient manuscripts, I think one of the oldest manuscripts that we have is, if I'm right, from the Coptic church, it was Syriac or something like this, uh, I'm not saying this with, with academic excellence. I just remember this this uh, fragment where in John's gospel, when Jesus says, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will lead you into all truth, that mm-hmm. in this fragment it was plural. And that's, early, or that's an early uh, fragment that goes way, way back. And apparently there's a book called the Gospel of Hebrews where the Holy Spirit is referred to as, as our mother. And apparently... Luther didn't have a problem in the world referring to the mother of the spirit as our mother. And then the, the Zinzendorf tradition um, has a lot of this in its hymnology. So I, I just think there's room for us to have an honest discussion. Yes. Why does the Old, Old, Old Testament, uh, which constitutes Jesus' scriptures, he would have heard that. Mm-hmm. Um, that would, we don't know because you, well, the New Testament is written in Greek. And so it's difficult to know if it would have been written in Aramaic, what would have if it would have continued on with that. I don't know the answer to those questions, but yeah. I love the fact that it's um, the Hebrew, in the Old Testament ruach is feminine. I just think there's something beautiful. I like women. I, I, I mean, who wants to be all the time around a bunch of stinky men? I mean, come on. You're welcome. You've been, this is wonderful when you have somebody like this in the audience, this beaming light over here that just is like soaking in everything and just, they're good. When you talk about um, uh, Ruach in the uh, Old Testament being feminine, are you also including uh, the word wisdom in Proverbs because that's consistently referred to as I think so, in Sophia. And um and I haven't done enough research to know how they'd handle that in the in the uh, Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew. Um, and I, I mean, it would be a great study for somebody who's really good with Hebrew to go back and see how the rabbis talked about this, because certainly Sophia is feminine wisdom, um, and I can't remember what the Hebrew word for wisdom is. Um, um, but anyway, it's certainly feminine, as is Shekinah, uh, Shekinah glory which is all that stuff in the Old Testament is really kind of close together. Spirit, kind of word, word um, uh, wisdom. It's, it's all, it's like a dawning of a light that has so many colors that right now all you see is white, but you're getting glimpses of other colors. And give me, you know, a hundred years, and I can tell you more about the colors that I see, maybe a thousand years, tell you a little bit more, but it's all there. It's just, it's taken us a long time to sort it through. I think that God is so beautiful, the Father, Son, and Spirit is so beautiful, It'll take us another couple of millennia before we can even begin to describe the Trinity in ways that are even close to being accurate. We're not going to overestimate this. So, it, you know, that's all those words, they're all together and um, they're nuanced, and, but feminine is right in the middle of them. Be interested about the angel of the Lord, uh, too. I, it's a lot of stuff like that. Go ahead. Oh. Yeah, let me bounce this off you and just see. Um, this is something I've learned probably in the last year. A contemplative prayer done with intention and consent. The consent side of it is saying yes. Um, and I kind of, I look, I'm looking at it through Hebrews chapter four. Uh, it's in verse, I guess. Let us, uh, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize. With our weaknesses, for we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are yet without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may 
receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. And so with the, uh, you're talking about different cultures and different ways that people are, are experience this freedom. Mm-hmm. Um, my question is, with the welcoming prayer, you say, I feel a frustration. I feel a disturbance within me. And I know that it's, I'm on the verge of something inside internally is wrong. Anger, whatever that emotion is. With intention and consent, I say, welcome, 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 three times. Mm -hmm. I feel that emotion. I don't judge it. I don't try to figure it out. I just allow myself to do it with compassion, with curiosity, being calm. And then I kind of feel feel to subside because I'm not fighting it. Then I'll say, I let go of my desire for power and control. I let go of my desire for esteem and affection. And I let go of my desire for survival and security. And the last part of the prayer is, I give this anger over to you. But it's something that's done slowly. It's done with contention and in, intention and consent. But it's something that I, I, I can't rush through. And I think it's very incarnational because I'm sensing that whatever disturbance I feel, whatever that emotion is, he feels it with inside me the same exact way that I do, the same magnitude, except he feels it and I'm receiving his mercy and I'm also um, finding grace discovering grace in that time of need. So... That's beautiful. I, th- I think you... Um, I often think... Of, I saw a scene one day, there was a bus in front of me, a school bus, and it stopped, and I was watching. Um, this girl got off the bus, and she ran down the driveway and then started up toward the house, and I could see the house here, and there was a grandmother sitting on the, the porch, and by the time the child got off the bus, the grandmother stood up deliberately. And I could see that. I couldn't see the child, but I could see the grandmother. And the grandmother met her at the porch and picked her up, and I could see the child was crying. And I don't know what happened. I mean, somebody made fun out of her, but fun of her or whatever, and hurt her feelings. And I watched this sense in which the grandmother identified with the pain of the grandchild and felt it like she felt it. But she also felt it as one who's been there. And she knows it's not the end of the world. And she knows that this can be turned into good. And so the grandchild in that embrace where she's, the grandmother is feeling her pain as it really is to her. And yet as one who has hope. So somehow the granddaughter begins to derive hope from the grandmother, probably without words. And I think that's what you're trying to get at. And I've got a good friend back in in, uh, Sydney, Australia named John. He's a doctor, a medical doctor named John Eden. And he's, he's into contemplation, and uh, he loves reading the mystics. And he said that when Teresa, I think it was Teresa of Avila, the, the nuns or sisters would come to her to teach her, them to pray, and she would say, go and pray the Lord's Prayer and take one hour to do it, one time. And it just forces you, our, wait a minute, our Father? How in the world could we call God our Father? That's unprecedented in history. And we just rattle through it most of the time, you know. But Jesus is saying, when you pray, pray this, our Father. That's already Jesus sharing his relationship with his Son with us. And then you just go through that thing slowly, and it's like something's going, something's happening. But it is Jesus sharing himself with us. And different people are wired different ways. Um, like I said earlier, I think some of us need a 30-year hug. I don't think we need anything but just to be held. We really need we really need Papa to hold us. Others need serious contemplation. Some need theological correction. I mean, there's lots of... But I, I have a great appreciation, and there's a great tradition within the Roman Catholic world of that. And we, you know, in the Protestant world, we poo-poo that well. They, blah, 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 blah. But there's something beautiful going on there. And in the Quakers, too. You know, I used to think, well, they're just getting together. I came from the tradition where you have strong preaching of the Word. you got these pulpits that are 40 feet tall because they're they're towering the Word of God's over the people. And 
I'm not like, well, I thought the word became flesh and dwelt among us, but or in us, but never let anyway. Um, the Quakers, you know, I would read about them, and they would get together, and nobody would say anything for the entire quote service. And what they would do is they would sit still. And you try to do that in modern America. You go somewhere and sit still for one hour, no words, no TV, no cell phone, no nothing, just sit still. And what they were trying to do was get in touch with the light within them. And they thought the light was within everybody. Well, based on what we've seen today, that's not some sort of mystical union with the one. That would be, I'm trying to get in touch with Jesus in me. And they had not uh, formulas, but you learn the processes of this. And I think there's something really helpful in our time about that. I mean, that's what meditating on the Word is about. That's why it's important to read different translations and how it strikes you. And Francois was saying, you know, he got struck by a verse the other day and he kind of hadn't been able to leave it for a month. <laughs> it's, it's that dwelling on this and letting it inform and correct and guide. And it's personal. And we're not to, we're not to pass judgment on that's too religious. You know, on the other side, we're, we're not to let that become so religious like we feel really guilty if we missed today and we didn't contemplate, you know, that kind of thing. McDonald, George McDonald's book, um, oh man, what's the name of it? Un, uh, Unspoken Sermons. Is um, If I had to make a top ten list, that would be number one. And there's an edition now by Roland Hine. It's a translation and edited. Of, it's called Christ in Creation. And that book, I was not ready for that book ten years ago. I read it and didn't get it. And now I'm thinking, how in the world? And I'm like, I underlined the whole book. I mean, we get together every Tuesday morning and we read through a chapter or a quote-unquote sermon. And they were unspoken sermons because no church would have him. So he wrote them anyway. And these sermons are like, they're taking you to places that are just unbelievable. I mean, I was like, how, how, what did he just say? How did he say? How, how could he know that? How could he see that? And so I re we read a chapter each week with the three friends of mine. We get together and we read that. We rarely get through a whole chapter and read it through, but we try to. And then we kind of go back and stun them. We think, what about this? What, what does that mean? We talk about this. So in a way, it's the same thing, except it's done in, a, in the privacy of, of my own study with just you know four men. Um, but that's been beautiful. But right, if you, that book is astounding. And you can get it on. You can get all 52 of McDonald's novels and books of poetry and his unspoken sermons on Kindle for 99 cents. But get that unspoken sermons today and read it 15 times. Is this the best? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.